Welcome back to another MAM chat. Uh, I'm here with Matt Pippenberg, um, and we are going to cover some, some interesting top topics today. Um, and you, you might remember that in a previous MAM chat, uh, we were talking about a, you know, a, a potential blow up or melt or, or melt up is probably a better word um, in stock markets that we get this fin final hooray when markets uh, totally uh, disconnect even more with economic reality. Um, I mean, th this is something that is, is unreal uh, in a world which is seeing economic problems everywhere. But nevertheless, that, that is one of the um, uh, op options or, or uh, potentials that we will see uh, in the stock market bef before this comes to an end. And, Mm -hmm. Matt, who's been involved, uh, William, with, uh, he's been in Wall, Wall Street, he's uh, been involved with hedge funds, run hedge funds. Um, you know, he has a lot of experience of, of these type of markets. So be interesting, Matt, to hear from you uh, how you see all of this ending uh, in, in, in mm -hmm. this uh, spe spectacular uh, bonanza mm -hmm. that we see now in, in markets. But, but how, how do you expect it to end? Mm -hmm. I think it ends the way it began. I mean, um, the, the operative word is debt and debt, we all kind of understand at an abstract level or even kind of an intellectual level, but at a market level, at the, at, the, at the ground level of looking at risk assets like stocks and bonds, there's absolutely no doubt that there's a direct correlation to a massive debt tailwind behind risk assets like stocks and bonds. And that's easy to see since 2008 when the Fed's suppressed interest rates and then used printed money to buy sovereign bonds and now buy commercial mortgage-backed security bonds or even junk bonds. When, when the Fed is keeping the cost of debt low, you can have a massive tailwind and have otherwise overbought securities like bonds continue to rise. And as the prices rise, the, the yields go down and interest rates go down. And that allows stocks and companies on the stock markets to use cheap or basically free debt to, to buy back their own shares or to produce dividends or to roll over their balance sheet debt day after day, year after year. So that's a massive tailwind. And cheap debt, free debt, or an extraordinary debt can create a melt-up. And it has effectively been a melt-up since 2009. When you step back though, Egon, uh, and look at debt beyond just risk assets and um, look at global debt. And I like to look at the global debt story and then look at the US markets as a bellwether. I'll, I'll pause and th talk to you for a second just about the World Bank's recent report on global debt and global GDP. And I think it's really quite fascinating and telling. Um, as of 2019, global GDP was at 88 trillion. And of course, 2020 has had the COVID experience and the COVID reaction. And what the World Bank is saying now, uh, Egon, is that they're predicting by year end a decline in global GDP of about five, five point two, five and a half percent, which is staggering number, I think even conservative. But it's important for us to keep in mind that the last time global GDP sank by five and a half percent was during World War II. And you and I talk about this, Egon, whatever one thinks of COVID, whether it's the, the, the great pandemic or an exaggerated hysteria, regardless of one's views on that, I think we can all agree uh, that COVID and, and the pandemic of 2020 cannot be compared to the devastation of World War II from Dunkirk to Stalingrad, Iwo Jima to Tokyo, North Africa to the Battle of Britain, the millions and millions of lives that were destroyed and lost, the economies that were destroyed. To compare COVID to the Second World War is an insult to true catastrophe. And what's remarkable about the, uh, the global GDP data is at the same time that the World Bank is predicting a 5.5% decline for 2020, they have this remarkable projection of a 4.5% rise in 2021. Where that's coming from, I don't know. But what's even more compelling is even if the GDP projections by the World Bank, which are highly optimistic, even if they were double what they're projecting, what has been deliberately omitted from this report is the fact that global debt is 260 trillion. So we have a global debt to income ratio of three to one. And I'll pause there and get your thoughts on that. But that's an extraordinary number, a debt number that is the elephant in the room. And at the global level, just like at the stock and bond market level, it's effectively being ignored by the elites and the media. And only very informed investors and hedge fund managers are aware of this debt and these risks. So at the global but, level yeah. right there. Yeah. But, you know, we discussed this many times 
forecasts, I mean, no one has the ability to forecast, you know, the, all these experts, whether they are the World Bank or the IMF or central banks, you know, all they always work on extrapolations of current trends. So, so they just, it will, uh, no one takes into account that something might happen. Uh, you, the, the uh, you know, I did the forecast when Trump was elected and said that um, U.S. debt uh, in 2016, I said U.S. debt will explode from 20 to 40 uh, mm -hmm. trillion um, in, the, in the next eight years. Um, mm -hmm. But of course, no mm -hmm. one believed that forecast because that was that was not an extrapolation. So therefore, it's not possible. But, you know, I took into account the, the, the way we look at the world, where you look, take into account the risk and what's happening in markets and that it, it, it is not uh, and nothing moves in a straight line. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and sadly, therefore, we are never getting uh, accurate forecasts. But, but as you said, now <laughs> we, we can at least look at the reality. And reality is that, that there is now a debt, which is uh, over three times a GDP. Mm -hmm. And it's obviously uh, globally, globally. Mm -hmm. The world globally. has never been, been in a situation like this. You know, you have individual countries that, that have uh, attained that type of debt level. But to have the whole world and you know, and still markets just enjoy um, a boom that right. that has never been seen in history before globally again. Uh, so therefore, you know how it, how is this going to end? Uh, but you know, and that's uh, I'll let you let you continue. Yeah. yeah, I think that's an interesting point. You talk about these projections on even U.S. debt, and you were talking about um, your projections, which I think were very fair and reasonable. And in fact, even the Congressional Budget Office of the United States, which just came out with its report last week, would agree with you, Egon. Last year, they were predicting about 30 trillion in federal debt uh, by 2030. In less than a year, that projection has now gone to 40 trillion debt in the US, federal public debt by 2030. So even the Congressional Budget Office can't ignore that. How it all ends though, I think is obvious. We can all make projections about debt. It's clear that debt is the elephant in the room. I don't think one needs tea leaves to see how this all ends. If debt is what's created this fantasy disconnect from global economy on its knees and stock markets rising. If debt created that, then debt will be the end of that, as we've discussed. And the tea leaves that I look at are very simple. It's the cost of debt, it's yields on bonds and it's interest rates. And we, we have been able, central banks around the world have been able to artificially repress those interest rates to the floor by printing money to, to monetize their own debt, to print their money, to buy bonds, keep yields and rates down, or to set interest rates negative or low or at zero. But that's an unsustainable policy. So what we're looking at now is you don't need to look at tea leaves. You need to look at interest rates and the central bank's ability to suppress those rates. What's remarkable now, when you use the World War II example, you know, as a young boy growing up in Germany or traveling between England and France, I got a chance to talk to a lot of people who remember World War II. And in particularly in Germany, and I remember sitting on a bench in Uberlingen talking to my friends who, were, who remembered the war, who were older. And they said, look, we knew the war was over. We just had to look around us. We didn't listen to Goering or the radio. We looked at the world around us. It was falling apart. And in the same way, the global market and the global economy, you don't need to be a hedge fund manager or an expert in precious metals to walk out your, out your front door, talk to your neighbors, look at the reality of the economy. It is like a form of propaganda today to see the New York Times or the Barons or the Wall Street Journal keep talking about new stimulus or new projections or new GDP or new tax revenue rejects, projections from the CBO or the Congressional Budget Office. But regardless of those projections or hope of more stimulus, stimulus just means more debt, more fiat currency. Look around your main street, your Hauptstrasse, your Rue Principale, wherever you are, from, from London to, to Paris to Berlin, to New York or you know, the West Coast to the East Coast, you see the economy falling. You see hope now that interest rates can stay lower, that stimulus will save you. But you can't repress interest rates forever and you can't manage the bond market forever. So I look at bond prices and interest rates and that's where it all ends. Uh, eventually the stimulus loses its stimulative effect. And in the meantime, it's, it's not a question of, of, of really projecting. It's just a question of common sense and history lessons, Egon. You can't play this game forever. And of course, you know, you have to prepare for the massive devaluations in currency and the massive overvaluations in bond and stocks. At one point, it does end. It doesn't matter whether it's next Tuesday or a year from Tuesday. You have to prepare. And precious metals, of course, we know is the obvious preparation for that. But 
I don't know if you see it any differently from where you're sitting, Egon, but it's an unsustainable policy and it ends when interest rates go up and when inflation comes. It's been buried for too long. You can't outlaw inflation and you can't keep interest rates at zero forever. No, and you know, we, as we said before, we, we discussed uh, recently the fact that, you know, we, we could see this melt up in markets when, when, you know, say the Dow doubles from here, which is just incredible. You know, on, on any criteria is uh, the markets are all are over, overvalued at this point. Mm -hmm. uh, but you, you always have this chance of a final move uh, as you outlined, totally liquidity driven, nothing to do with reality. Um, mm -hmm. And you know th that would be really a good ending to a, uh, the biggest bubble uh, or market in, in history uh, to see, mm -hmm. you know, similar, we saw it in 99 in the NASDAQ, how it doubled in, mm -hmm. in the last mm -hmm. few months. Yeah, yeah, and I remember very well. Fell by 80%, but you know, when, when, when but you and I see this, uh, potential of a move of that of that magnitude you know i'm certainly not telling anyone that they should be in the stock market but the risks no. are enormous um mm -hmm. and uh, you know the risk of a just a sudden fall uh, is mm -hmm. massive and, and and you know we've seen all just in the last few days it's crazy the market is crazy you know on a few mm -hmm. tweets that's what mm -hmm. that all you only need a tweet <laughs> to move the market 500 points up or down I mean, that's yep. incredible. A tweet from a president in the middle of the night, you know, that moves the markets. Um, and, and, you know, that, then we can see what kind of markets we have. They are not real markets. Uh, so it, it's really meaningless if the market doubles from here, for example, the Dow, it, it's, it mm -hmm. means nothing. And, uh, you know, as, uh, cautious investors or well preservation investors should not uh, be concerned about that at all. Because if market, if, if, if the uh, Dow goes up to 50,000 and doubles from here, you know, gold uh, is probably going to meet the Dow at, at, the, at the same level as, you know, one for one, like it was in 1980. So, so you mm -hmm. know, gold might then be $50,000. So, you know, that which means that gold will go up 25 times from here uh, and the Dow right. twice. So, you know, right. you rod in gold and it's a lot safer, especially if if we don't see that uh, final melt up and you get you get a instead a, a collapse. Um, yeah. yeah, but, uh, you know, so, you know, Coming back to your point, you know, this, you know, I had um, I had a discussion, uh, Matt, uh, with with a uh, old friend of mine who was a, a very senior banker in 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 London, uh, and also uh, then was a, a very senior man in in, in a major uh, hedge fund, mm -hmm. and uh, he's now retired for many years. But nevertheless, you know, he said to he agrees with everything I say, and he, he enjoys reading my newsletters very much. Passes them on to mm -hmm. other hedge funds, he says, uh, <laughs> but they don't understand any, or they don't agree with any, or, uh, any of that, of course. But mm -hmm. you know, but the one thing he said to me, because you know, I've been writing about that that rates are going to, like you just said, it's going to end with rates, you know, bonds mm -hmm. crashing and and, mm -hmm. and and rates going up very fast, at least to the level of the nineteen. Uh, um, mm -hmm. And uh, the, the the 1970s when when we mm -hmm. saw 15 to 20 percent rates in many many mm -hmm. countries, um, mm -hmm. and you know my view is that the uh, central banks will lose control initially of the long end of the market, um, mm -hmm. and then the long end when those uh, when the bonds come down in price and uh, and interest rates go up, the the the, mm -hmm. the high interest rates for the long end of the market will pull the short um, end up also. Right. But he said mm -hmm. to me this uh, banker that. Um, there's no chance central banks will never allow interest rates to go up because they will mm -hmm. buy everything in sight. Uh, mm -hmm. And of course, there'll be a, a lot on offer. So because mm -hmm. of the, the ex existing bonds that people will, you know, China will sell them, Japan will sell them, uh, mm -hmm. and invest, mm -hmm. many investors will sell them on. And then you will have unlimited mm -hmm. supply of new mm -hmm. bonds coming onto the market because of the financing requirements. Mm -hmm. um, but so he said the, the, the Fed and the central banks will buy everything. That's mm -hmm. possible, of course, uh, very well, possible. Well, think about what that suggests. And that, look, it is a possibility. I've talked to a lot of PMs and portfolio managers throughout the years and certainly throughout the last few weeks about precisely that idea. Has, has the central banks effectively monetized the entire credit markets to a point where they can have deficits without tears, uh, monetize or that is print money to buy every debt instrument to force interest rates to the zero bound for eternity. 
I mean, if even if that were true, which by the way is the exact opposite of free market capitalism or supply and demand, we'd have to put a, a rest in peace sign over the uh, normal concept of free market capitalism. But if that were true and we had complete Wall Street socialism, where central banks effectively bought the credit markets and kept interest rates at zero bound or the low bound for eternity, um, the only way to do that, of course, is to create the money necessary to buy the bonds and to keep that in a closed circuit loop between treasury departments and central banks and governments and central banks, and therefore outlaw inflation and outlaw um, higher interest rates. That would require a tremendous amount of fiat currency creation. And there's no way that to do that for another 10 years, you could get away with that without even neutering even further the absolute disaster in the currency markets and the purchasing power of your respective currency, be it a dollar or a Canadian dollar, Australian dollar, or a euro, a peso. So the solution is in, a, it, in and of itself worse than the cure or the disease that is because you are effectively destroying currency. And then that brings me to my final point to you, Egon. Fine, regardless of whether interest rates can be magically manipulated for eternity without destroying the currency, which we know it can't, at some point, this all ends, whether it's in a low rate or a high rate environment, the currency markets end. The debt market has to have some type of reset. The currency market has to have some type of reset. We all know this. Hedge fund managers know this. They play the short game for now. But the long term game is you can't have uh, 12 martinis without a hangover. You can't print money eternally to control the debt market. This, this charade will end. And my question to you is when it ends, however it ends, and I think I, we all know how it ends. Regardless of when, whether it's this week or next year or a year from next year, we know the end game. And I'm curious what you think policymakers will do when the jig is up, whether it's a new form of cryptocurrency, gold-backed crypto, whether it's a debt jubilee, which we know has no real solution in it. What do you actually see policymakers doing when they realize you can't have 12 martinis without a hangover? What, what will the policy reaction be oh, to solve yeah. this disaster? Well, you know, you made the point firstly, and that's, you know, coming back to my ba banker friend, and, and he's probably right that they will buy everything inside the central banks, mm -hmm. every debt instrument there is, uh, not not just uh, government debt, but all debt. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the, uh, um, the problem is, of course, uh, the weak point here is, as you pointed out, and I'm going to stress that, that's the currency. You know, if you start with the Fed, if they, they are going to buy more and more, the, 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 the dollar has already fallen 98% since 71 um, yeah. and, and almost 80% since, uh, since 2000. So, you know, it will be all reflected in the dollar and the, the dollar will, will start its, its super exponential fall um, mm -hmm. as this happens. And of course, Therefore, you have, when you, there's no you, the, the, the bonds that the, are issued by central banks and especially the Fed here, they will have zero value. If the currency has zero value, so will the bonds. <laughs> and that's what's going to drive the interest rates up. Whatever they buy, you know, they can't yeah. stop it. Um, yeah. so, so this is, you know, br bring, brings us back, uh, Matt, to, to, the, to the end game. You know, I, I think there will be, there's obviously no end game. You know, the world, mm. the world has always gone on you know, until, right. the, uh, and, until there is a meteorite destroying the world totally, <laughs> you know, life right. will go on here or until the, the sun disappears or whatever. Sure. Um, uh, you know, uh, li life will go on just in different forms. But if we yeah. talk about the short term, um, central banks, um, they, they, they will initially start with um, creating artificial instrument to divert the attention to their weak currencies and their weak debt situation. And that mm -hmm. might be a digital currency or, or, or you know, crypto dollar, for example. And, and you know, it's already been talked about uh, and, and many mm -hmm. central banks are preparing this already. Um, mm -hmm. And then they will, they will, will find a way of, of making the debt disappear in the original currency uh, and, and say, mm -hmm. now we have this currency. Instead, of course, the, 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 whatever new currency they create is another form of fiat money. It's another mm -hmm. con, um, and it's another mm -hmm. form of fake money uh, that now yeah. can be printed electronically, and at the same time, you can control all the people and all the spending and turn it off with with a with mm -hmm. a press of a button if you want to. Yeah. So that type of reset, if that happens, which is not impossible, and at the, you mm -hmm. know they might at the same time say that okay, gold now as an indicative value of, of 10,000 or 20,000 or whatever. They, they right. might do that, but, but you know, this, 
there's no, there's not going to be a global revaluation of gold uh, backing a currency. I don't believe that at all. Mm -hmm. It might be that the U.S. tries something, but you know, the, the, the one who holds the gold <laughs> has the power, and, and and you know, I doubt that the U.S. has much gold at all. Uh, not the 8,000 tons they say, and, and I think China has a lot more, not not, right. not just uh, the few thousand tons that they uh, officially announced, but they probably have 20,000 plus. Uh, so mm -hmm. you know, China will have the power. And of course, you know, China's GDP mm -hmm. has gone up, whatever, 175 times in, in, in the last 50 years, I think it is, whilst mm -hmm. the US has gone up 20 times. So, you know, yep. China will be the new superpower. If we don't have a Chinese revolution, that would be the mm -hmm. next superpower. And they mm -hmm. will pull the strings in the meantime, as as the U.S. declines and the China's already in seventy one when when the U.S. took away the gold backing of the dollar, they already said then officially right. said this is the beginning of the end for the U.S. Um, yeah. Yeah. economy and and the dollar. So so yeah. you know there will be this attempt. I, there could be this attempt of an orderly reset by by for example the U.S. Not not globally. I don't believe that. Yeah. But that's not going to work for more than a short period, whether that's six or twelve months or shorter. Uh, but you know, and then you still have you know the, the weak point as you uh, as we both said is the currency, and it'll be uh, initially the the dollar, and and yeah. that's going, that's how every uh, one of these bubble economy uh, economies had fallen um, in history, where there is, yeah. in, in, as we have both discussed and written about in the third century in, in, in Rome, or whether it's in, in, in France um, in the uh, 1720s. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what's going to happen again, the collapse of the currency, that, 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 that is the, the final stage of, of, yeah. of, of a, of a debt-driven system. Um, yeah. And therefore, I think we will see an orderly uh, reset now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. uh, disorderly and disorderly reset with <laughs> with all values collapsing, you know, uh, and collapsing by by amounts that no one can imagine. Um, yeah. uh, and of course, you know, it's uh, gold. Gold will reflect all of this. Gold will ref, re reflect the destruction of, of the of the bubble paper assets, um, yeah. uh, and 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 therefore, you know, all. All roads lead to gold. You know, we are not. Yeah, you know, mm. I'm not a gold bag, nor are you. I'm just someone who sees that gold is the best protection mm. and the best insurance um, mm. a, a, against a, a system which is about uh, to collapse, or, or at least has the potential to collapse. And we know, even if it doesn't collapse, we know that the currencies will collapse because of the printing, and that, and gold will reflect that. So it's just, you know, it's the most. Is the most beautiful investment you can ever hold in these markets, as long as you hold the physical, as long as you store yeah. it outside a, a fragile banking system. Then, then it, it, you know, you know, we've been into gold, uh, helping people around the world for twenty years, and now, you know, now is actually the time starting when this is going to accelerate. So, mm -hmm. if you don't own gold today, uh, you will, and, and but have other investments or money in the bank, you will suffer dramatically. Um, yeah. And you know, I've talked about institutions going into gold. They are going to. They are not going. They are starting already with Buffett and and, and Ohio mm -hmm. Police Pension Fund. And you know, the market mm -hmm. isn't big enough for them to go in with even with half a percent uh, of their right. assets. But they, what will happen is that the price of gold will revalue to you know ten times today. That's the only way to satisfy our demand because there is no more supply. Yeah. So you know this is that so the real moves we we we've been in this for twenty years to see gold going up from three hundred when we started to 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 two thousand today almost mm -hmm. um, but that's the the real move is about to start now in the next yeah. few years and and again yeah. it's not a, we're not talking about investment we're talking about wealth preservation and insurance it will be a good investment too but that's secondary here um, yeah. But, no, it's, yeah, well, it's interesting though. It's very interesting. I won't, I won't, I know we had to jump so we don't stay on too long, but it is interesting what you say. And even, even though I come from more of a background in risk assets and fa fancy strategies with stocks and bonds, the majority of the hedge funds uh, that I've invested with or even managed or certainly talked to the portfolio managers, what it, regardless of what we had on our balance sheet, so to speak, what it, regardless of what we were trading long and short or arbitraging, when you sit down with someone for dinner and ask them where their own assets are, and this has been true for the last eight to 10 years, many of us were buying physical gold, regardless of what the headlines said about the trade. 
So it is more about wealth preservation than a speculation, but the writing's on the wall historically. What we've done in a debt-based tailwind and a debt-based quote-unquote solution to a debt problem is set up an obvious paradigm for gold and silver and gold in particular. So, you know, I'll, I'll pause there and end there because I don't want to drag this on too long, but it's not about being a gold bug. It's about preserving wealth and having common sense and a little bit of respect for history and, and a cold reality check on how central banks have gone too far with their quote unquote stimulus. And the fact that a tweet can move the market is just proof that hope and fear have now replaced fundamentals completely. And that's where mm -hmm. we are today. Mm -hmm. Matt, you know, as I said, we've been into this particular era of wealth preservation for 20 years as, as uh, me as an individual, as a company. Uh, but, you know, now it's actually starting now. I mean, the, the, the final phase, the, the super yeah. exponential phase, as I call it, is starting now. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, we, we will have a lot to talk about in, in, in coming months and years, uh, and that will yeah. be exciting. Um, uh, and yeah. so... I look forward to the next time, Matt. Um, and, okay, you got uh, it. Thanks for this time. See you. Good. Good talking Bye. with you. Bye-bye.